title of the message is called The Desire of Ages and the Godhead. The reason being that there are two statements in this wonderful book that are used prominently by many to teach a trinity. So we're going to examine some aspects of the Desire of Ages. And at the end of this study, you will see the evidence, how overwhelming it is, that no one who is honest could ever teach a trinity from those two statements when you see the harmony of everything she wrote, particularly in that book, but other, other statements as well. So most of this is, is from the spirit of prophecy because we're answering this objection from the spirit of prophecy. So if you'd like to kneel with me, I will ask God's blessing. Eternal loving and heavenly Father, what a privilege, a joy it is that we call thee Father and that we truly understand the meaning of those words, particularly as we come before thee in the name of thy Son. And that's been such a blessing to us to know this truth and believe this truth and we thank thee for having revealed it to us. And we pray with this study that it may be revealed to many more of your died people throughout the world. So please, please bless us now as we study from the writings of thy messenger that thou sent for us. And we pray you'll keep us alert and, and uh, mindful, Lord, as we study these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The two passages in the, quoted in the Desire of Ages that are used to teach the Trinity Particularly these two. Well, they're actually the only two I know of. Desire of Ages, page 530. And Desire of Ages, page 671. I'm, only going to, I'm going to deal with the first one just briefly because, to be honest with you, it's not an objection at all. The second one, almost the entire study will be on the third person got it, the second um, objection. As I was saying, this, these statements are used to try and teach a trinity. The first one... In Christ is life original, unborrowed and underived. If you take this to mean that Christ never had a beginning, then you have to conclude that he's not really a son. You can't have it both ways. You've got to be honest with yourself. If you're saying this life, this statement means he had no beginning, therefore he cannot be a son. That means that God is not really a father. That means that there's no true relationship between these two beings. That means that the father and son relationship is metaphorical. All that you have to honestly conclude if you understand those words to mean that Christ did not, was not truly begotten. It becomes metaphorical. And that means that this is what you must conclude. You have God the Father, which no one disagrees. He's a divine being. He's the one true God. Has always existed, of course. And of course, he received his divine nature from no one. No one disagrees with this point. But if you believe original, unborrowed, and derived, applying to Christ means he had no beginning, then you have to also concede that he is truly, or really, God the Son. Which means he too, being a divine being, which of course we acknowledge, but it means that he has also always existed, eternal. And that he received his divine nature from no one. Because they say it's original, un un unborrowed, underived. Therefore, he's always existed. He did not receive his divine nature from anybody. That means that he's co-eternal with the Father, which is exactly what the fundamental beliefs of the Adventist Church teach. Friends, that means that this term here, Father and this term Son, are simply metaphorical. They're not true. They're not real. They're not literal. They can't be because there is no relationship between these two. This one has always been. He's divine. He's always existed. He did not receive his divinity from anyone. That's two gods. It's inescapable. Anyone who is honest has to acknowledge this. And I believe in the Trinity. You want to use the Zara of Ages, page 530. You have to believe in at least two gods, which is polytheism. And as I said, this is inescapable. I've shared this with ministers, with theologians, and they can't answer it. They'll never answer it. 
the only way you can teach that Christ is divine and not be a second God is if he is truly a son and he received that divine nature from his father making him of course equal with God in every way by nature and that's exactly what the scripture teaches in Hebrews it's exactly what it teaches you don't have to believe in polytheism or multiple gods you can believe in the one true God and his only begotten son from, from whom he created all things notice verse 1 God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken unto us by his son and he doesn't mean his son from Bethlehem notice by his son whom he have appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds God made the world through his son friends before this earth was even created before Bethlehem he was called the son of God he made the world through him look what it says about the son was he any less than the father is he any less who being the brightness of his the father's glory and the express image of his person and notice what it says about Jesus upholding all things by the word of his power Christ is not only the creator of all things he's also the sustainer of all things he upholds all things by the word of his power he's equal with the father in every respect and being and verse 4 talking about the son being made so much better than the angels notice how he received his divine nature he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they much greater than the angels he is the commander of the angels he's the divine son of God and it's because he's the son of God that he's he's equal with the father in every respect now that's what it goes on to say the next two verses For I, look what the Paul says now this is interesting he just finished telling us how he received by inheritance a more excellent name or nature than the angels of course look what he says now he's, he's proving his argument for unto which of the angels said he at any time thou art my son this day have I begotten thee what Paul is saying here is when did God ever say this to any angel as mighty as they are God never said these words to an angel you're my son this day have I begotten thee and again I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son and once again friends this is not referring to Bethlehem as we saw from verse 2 God made the world through his son look at verse 6 and when he that's the father bringeth in the first begotten into the world so he's the first begotten son of God from eternity friends as Micah tells you and many more passages as Christ himself tells you and this is why he's equal with God and we don't have to believe in multiple gods so this is all the problems you have in wrongly understanding the Zara of Ages page 530 in the original unborrowed and underwrite this statement by the way this statement this is not the original this was written or brought out at least published a year before the Zara of Ages in first selected messages page 296 and 297 and if those adjectives mean that you have no beginning look at the problem you have now because look who else receives the original unborrowed and underived life first look at the messages page 296 as I said this was written at least a year before the Zara of Ages and this is where the Zara of Ages being a compilation where that statement comes from talking about Christ in him was life original unborrowed underived this life is not inherent in man he can possess it only through Christ he cannot earn it it is given him as a free gift you see that friends the redeemed sinner the saints in heaven will receive original unborrowed underived life it's given to them you see that statement in the Zohar of Ages is not describing Christ it's describing the life he received the life is original unborrowed underived it's the life of God that's what he received by inheritance and that's what also the redeemed receive as well from whom did Christ receive it? He will tell us himself. John 5, 26. For as the Father has life in himself, what sort of life does the Father have? Original unborrowed, underived, it's eternal life. So has he given to the Son. Just as the Son will give that life to us one day if we're faithful, so he receives it also from his Father. This is why, as I said earlier, I didn't want to spend too much time on that. I don't think it's an objection at all. But uh, having said that, before we go on to the Holy Spirit, 
I was in Waitara Church many years ago. A theologian from Andrews University called Des Fortin, church historian, mind you. He did a whole presentation almost on Desire of Ages, page 530, original unborrowed, underived. And he was really building it up, trying to show that Christ had no beginning, etc., etc. And as I said to you, he's a historian. When he finished, I went up to him, waited my turn to ask him a question. I finally got the opportunity and I said, Pastor, you just presented all night this statement, trying to prove that Christ has no beginning, etc. He said, yes. I said, you know, this statement was written one year earlier. It's found in First Selected like, Messages, 296, 297, and I quoted the statement to him. And I told him that we're told in that statement from the same author, Sister White, that we too will receive, or it's given to us, original unborrowed unto right life. And as I said to you, this man's a church historian. His response was he was actually quite angry, and his response was, that's not what it says. And I quoted it to him, that's exactly what it says. We just read it. That's exactly what it says. That the original unborrowed under right life is given to the saints as a free gift, friends. But of course he couldn't answer that, so he had to refuse that that's what it was saying. This is what I mean by this is not an objection. It cannot be answered. Regarding the Zara of Ages, this is how it should be read. Notice a small T. This is how Sister White wrote it. We're going to see the original letter. Found in the Zara of Ages, page 671. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. Come with me to John chapter 6, 16. We're going to study two verses, or we're going to read them now. And as we study this statement, we're going to receive the answer for these two verses. And these are two verses that, if you're a Trinitarian, you'll never understand. In fact, it's impossible. It's when we receive light on a, on a subject that that sheds more light on, on similar subjects. In fact, there's a lot of believers who have struggled to understand this passage. John 16, 7. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. In other words, profitable for their advantage that he would go away. And that's what he goes on to say. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Why can the comforter not come unless Jesus goes? He says it clearly. If I go not away, he will not come. But if I go away, I will send him unto you. And so it's for their advantage that he would go back to heaven. Why? Now think about that for a moment. The Trinity, the Spirit is someone else, another, another being. It's a different being altogether. If that's the case, what's the difference if Christ goes or not? It's a different being. But Christ here is saying clearly, unless he goes away, the spirit, the comforter cannot come. Notice also John 7, verse 39. We'll read 38 and 39. This gives us a, one clue as to why he has to go away. John 7, 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What did Christ mean by that? Next, verse 39. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him would receive. Notice that, by the way. You had to believe on him. Believe what on him? That he's the Son of God, primarily. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. The Holy Ghost could not be given. This is speaking about the comfort. This is speaking about Pentecost. The Holy Ghost has been given throughout the history of the Bible, but not the power it's talking about here. This was not given yet. And we read in John 16 that Christ has to go away before it can be given. And here he's telling you why. It was not yet given because Christ was not yet glorified. For Christ to be glorified, what must happen? Yes, he can live that perfect life, of course. After it on the cross. If he hasn't lived a perfect life, he's not going to come out of the tomb. So he has to live a perfect life, take it to the cross on our behalf, and then come out of the tomb glorified. After Christ is glorified, you can receive, they could receive the Holy Ghost or the Comforter at Pentecost. So remember, this is very important, this point here. And as we study this statement, this is the White Road a long time ago, we're going to see a beautiful truth, wonderful truth. This was written in 1898. 
I have a question. If many today want to use this statement to teach the Trinity, to teach the Holy Spirit as another being, how come no one living in Ellen White's day saw it that way? How come her sons didn't see it that way? How come MC Wilcox, who was the editor of the Review and Herald for 25 years, never saw it that way? She's alive. She's, she's working with them. How come none of the people alive at that time, to our knowledge, took this statement to believe in some other being or a trinity? We should think about that. They were closer to her than we could ever be, particularly her own, her own sons. For example, here's MC Wilcox. Take note of the date here, actually of the following statements. Take note of the date, 1911. Well after the Zorro of Ages, 1898, a long time later. Look what he says about the Holy Spirit. How come he didn't believe it was a third being? Holy, and, and you watch what he quotes from. The Holy Spirit is the mighty energy of the Godhead. The life and power of God flowing out from him. Beautiful, beautiful to all parts of the universe. And first, making a living connection between his throne and all creation. As is expressed by another, what he's about to quote, that another is the sister wife from the Zara of Ages, page 805. And so he certainly didn't read the Zara of Ages and believe in the Trinity. As is expressed by another, the Holy Spirit is the breath of spiritual life in the soul. The impartation of the Spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. That's from Zara of Ages, page 805. It first makes Christ everywhere present. And that's how he's answering questions and answers there from in the signs of times. So as you can see, this was the consistent belief among the church and those in leading positions of, of printing, etc. Another one, 1908. A long time after the Zorro Ages. Again, M.T. Wilcox, Signs of the Times. Jesus Christ has forever blended the divine with the human. And from him flows out the spirit of life to all his children. Again, we see the consistency there. And no one was teaching a trinity about the, about the spirit. Again, M.C. Wilcox. Look at the date this time. 1919. Wherever God's children are, there is a spirit. That's what he says now. Not an individual person. They use that very statement, third person of God had to teach another individual person. And here we are in 1919, where the Zara of Ages has been out for close to uh, 30 years, where leading brethren in the movement are still teaching the Holy Spirit was not an individual person. He actually emphasizes that. As we look upon persons, but having the power to make present the Father and the Son, why not leave it there? Why not know that the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Deity, goes out into all the earth, bringing the presence of God to every heart that will receive it. So we can see that our pioneers, or late, later pioneers anyway, did not change their position because of the desire of ages. Now, this one. This is her son, Willie Wade. This is 1935. I forgot to mention the previous, Sister Wade had died four years ago, 1919, she died in 1915. And now in 1935, a long time after her death, what was Willie teaching her son, who'd been her closest worker, without a doubt, in her ministry after the James died? Willie Wade, there are many scriptures which speak of the Father and the Son, and the absence of scripture making similar reference to the united work of the Father and the Holy Spirit of, or of Christ and the Holy Spirit has led me to believe that the Spirit without individuality was a representative of the Father and the Son throughout the universe. If anyone should have changed his position, it should have been this brother. And yet his teaching is a representative of the Father and the Son without any individuality. It was through the Holy Spirit that they dwell in our hearts and make us one with the Father and with the Son. And one more. This is Sister White now. Notice what she says about how the faith was established in our church. The leading points of our faith as we hold them today were firmly established, point after point was clearly defined. When we talk about leading points of our faith, friends, especially regarding who God is, especially regarding who the Holy Spirit is and, and, and the Son of God, etc., these are truly leading points, particularly as when they came together, Sister White being a Methodist, and James White being non-Trinitarian, these would have been some of the first things they would have discussed because some of them were Trinitarian before they were brought out of the other churches. So she says, they were clearly, firmly established, point after point, and clearly defined. 
All the brethren came into harmony. The whole company of believers were united in the truth. There were those who came in with strange doctrines, but we were not afraid to meet them. Notice what it says now. Our experience was wonderfully established by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. This is so important because for the church to teach today that it believes in the Trinity as its second of all its fundamental beliefs, they have to, they cannot but concede that the church was established on their efforts. Because you can't, this maturing in truth and etc., that's, that's uh, impossible. The truth about God and the Trinity are diametrically opposed. One's from the Antichrist, one's from Babylon, and one is the truth is found in the Word of God. You can't say, you, you don't mature from a total darkness. It's not, it's not like God's showing more light on the same principle. These are totally opposites. Inspiration tells us here that, that every point, every leading point of our faith was clearly established how? By the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So the churches today had to concede that the church was wrong then. Therefore it was not established by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And what's worse, if the Trinity is truth, that means the Adventist church today has received the truth from the fallen Babylonian churches who are Trinitarian, predominantly, from which we're supposed to call people out of. So you can see all the objections that come in. Notice what else we're told. Take notice of these dates too. How can you use Sister Wyatt to teach to turn the ship in a new direction, as they say, with the Dire of Ages, when in 1903 she's saying everything was firmly established from the beginning, all the leading points. And in 1905 she wrote this. The truths that have been substantiated by the manifest working of God are to stand fast, not to be changed. Let no one presume to move a pin or a foundation stone from the structure. Not the least thing, friends. Clearly established by God. That's what she says about those who try. Those who attempt to undermine the pillars of our faith are among those of whom the Bible says that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And sadly, that's exactly what has happened. It's come true. Many have departed from the faith, unfortunately. And that's what the Trinity is, friends. It's a doctrine of the Antichrist. Therefore, what did Sister White mean by this statement? The mighty agency of the third person of Godhead. What did she mean by that? The first thing we need to understand is the Zohar of Ages is a compilation. It was compiled from many other writings of hers, books. She did write some parts specifically for the Zohar of Ages when she was here in Australia. But this statement here that we're reading, it did not originate in the Zohar of Ages, nor did the other statement we saw earlier, original, unborrowed, underived. It was first written in 1896, two years before. Not far from here, Sunnyside Kurumbal, about an hour from where we're meeting today. That's where the source is of this statement. This is the letter. Notice there? Sunnyside Kurumbal, February 6, 1896. This is where the statement comes from in the Zohar of Ages. If you go on the CD-ROM, type in third person of the Godhead, you'll get 22 hits. That's a bit of a misrepresentation. From her pen, she wrote this five times, maybe six. Five or six times, but I think it's five. But it's hard, one of them is hard to pick, if it's original or not. So five times from her pen. The others are all copies, of course. And friends, she was not teaching a third being, as we saw from Willie White, as we saw from Wilcox, etc. None of them changed their positions. Well after she even died, well after the writing of the Zara of Ages. For example, from this letter, now this is, and I really appeal to you to look up this letter and read it. The theme or the context is about Battle Creek. She's in Australia. There's troubles in Battle Creek. Of course, sin's getting in the way and there's problems. And she's counseling them. And that's why she mentions sin could be overcome only through the agency of the third person who got it. So she's writing to leading brethren in Battle Creek. She's trying to get them you know, to be right, etc. This is the same letter, watch this. This is the same letter. I would like to actually show more from it, but take too many slides. Where she says third person got it, that's page 26. The same page, she says, his spirit, referring to Jesus. The next page of the same letter calls it God's spirit. 
page 27 and 28, she calls it the voice of the Spirit of God. Verse page 30, she says, let Christ work by His Holy Spirit. And page 32, she calls it the Spirit of Christ. If you read this letter in its context, as, as, as noticing these statements here, there's no way you'll understand third person of the Godhead to mean another being. She tells you there, it's the Spirit of Christ. Let Christ work by His Holy Spirit. The same letter. Even the same page, she says, His Spirit. And God's Spirit, etc. So the only way you can take that statement and try and teach a trinity from it is to take it away from its context, separate it from, the, from its connect, proper connection. And we're told that's exactly what many would do, Sister White has told us. There are some who, upon accepting erroneous theories, strive to establish them by connect, collecting from my writings statements of truth, which they use separated from their proper connection and perverted by association with error. Unfortunately, that's exactly what's happened. They've taken a simple letter where, as I showed you from the context, you could not possibly get it wrong. They separated from its context and associated with error, unfortunately. Now, as I said earlier, as we're going to study what she meant by this term, remember, she wrote this five or six times originally, from her pen only. Now, this is the principal point of this whole study. You've got to get this. You look up the five slash six times she wrote this with her pen. Never once did she use this statement, third person of the Godhead, in the context of the Holy Spirit in heaven before sin, or during a war in heaven, or anywhere during the Old Testament times, or in the new heaven and earth. Never once. The five or six times she used this term from her pen, every time, now this is so important, every time was only in connection with the Comforter. Remember how we read? If I go not away, the Comforter will not come, but if I go away, I will send him unto you. The Holy Spirit was not yet given because Christ was not yet glorified. Something about the comfort has to do with Christ being glorified and him having to go away. This is the original letter. Notice how it's always in connection with the comforter. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And here's a statement from the original letter and from the Zorro Ages. Evil had been accumulating for centuries and could only be restrained and resisted by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. Who is the third person of the Godhead? It's the comforter who Christ would send after he departed. Remember this point, crucial. And because evil had been accumulating at Battle Creek, this is why she's writing this to them. He's saying, look, your sin's only going to be restrained, only going to be overcome through this third person of the Godhead or the comforter. It's unfortunate that today theologians use the statement in the Zara of Ages to take it out of its context, to teach a trinity, take it out of its proper connection, when all you had to do was read the original letter, and as I showed earlier, she's talking about Christ's spirit, she's talking about the spirit of God, she's talking about the voice of the spirit of God, etc. And as we saw, Sister White warned us that that would happen. But notice this, for example. This is, again, from D8. Notice, sin could be resisted and overcome only for the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. Notice, these are, of course, are hits as well on the CD, so these are copies as well. But notice the numbers compared to five times from her writing. Notice the numbers. The Spirit of God, almost 5,000 times. The Spirit of Christ. Over a thousand times. His Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, Spirit of Jesus, God's Holy Spirit, Christ's Spirit. These are all terms that Sister White wrote. And as I said, those numbers, are, of course, would be many copies as well. But look at the numbers compared to 22 hits of the third person of the Godhead, which is really only five. You know, if you're going to go by numbers, then you can't possibly get it wrong, consistency. Notice also the contradictions. They come in from the desire of ages alone. If we try to teach the first person to guide it from the desire of ages is another divine being. Notice the contradictions it brings in. In page 166 of the desire of ages. While Jesus ministers in the sanctuary above, he is still by his spirit, the minister of the church on earth. Same book. 
who's telling us it's Christ by His Spirit that's ministering in the church on earth. The Zara of Ages, page 805. This is the one M.C. Wilcox was quoting. Christ breathed His Spirit upon them. The impartation of the Spirit is the impartation of life of Christ. Take note of that life of Christ later on. We'll see how important that is. And again from Desire of Ages. These three statements, all from Desire of Ages. Christ gives them the breath of his own spirit, the life of his own life. So this is just some of the many contradictions you'll face in trying to reinterpret or take that statement out of its proper connection. Here's some more. These are all from Desire of Ages, but these ones I've chosen, they're all around Desire of Ages 671. They're just a page before or a page or two later. They're all in the same chapter. Let not your heart be troubled. That beautiful chapter in the DA, that's where the third person of Godhead is found. Notice all these statements in the same chapter. By the Spirit, the Saviour would be accessible to all. He comforts them with His own presence. Christ stands by His side. By the Spirit, He said He would manifest Himself to them. Notice the pages, 669. Not somebody else, Himself. Page 671. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to impress his own character upon his church. That's important, that one. Page 672. Without the cooperation of the spirit of God, the power of God awaits the demand and reception. 676. Abiding in Christ means a constant receiving of his spirit and receive from him by faith the strength and perfection of his own character. Very important, that one there perfection of his own character. And 671, the third person that got it, would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power, Christ has given his spirit as a divine power. So we've seen from the Zara of Ages, Christ ministers by his spirit, it's the breath of his own life, and even the very same chapter, we're told it's his spirit, we're told it's the power of God, it's the spirit of God, it's the life of Christ, it's Christ manifesting himself. It's his own character, etc. Receiving of his spirit. How can you get it wrong? It's impossible. You have to separate it from his connection. Plus, remember we saw it's in connection with the comforter coming. Who does Sister White say the comforter is? Saviour is our comforter. Jesus is the comforter. Let them study the 17th of John and learn how to pray and how to live the prayer of Christ. He is the comforter. As I said, friends, earlier, and there's some, some statements that come much more powerful. In the light of this evidence, there's no way in the world you can teach the first person of God is some other divine being. Not honestly, in the light of this evidence. Especially you can't use sister way to do so. You need to study these things carefully, contextually. For example, 1 SM 344. You read this statement by itself, and you'd have a good Good reason to believe the Holy Spirit is somebody else. Christ our mediator and the Holy Spirit are constantly interceding in man's behalf. But the Spirit pleads not for us, as does Christ, who presents his bloodshed from the foundation of the world. So she's telling us the Spirit does not work for us like Christ does. He's in heaven, interceding in heaven, presenting, presenting his blood. The Spirit works upon our hearts, drawing up prayers, penance, praise and thanksgiving. This is a statement the Trinitarians use a lot. And it seems like she's talking about two different uh, offices of work and Spirit and Christ in a different office. But notice when you compare it with other statements of hers like we just saw. The age 166. While Christ ministers in the sanctuary above, he is still by his Spirit the minister of the church on earth. Now you can see how he's pleading with his blood uh, in heaven and yet he's still the minister of the church on earth. It's not somebody else. And the end, his energizing presence is still with his church. So as you compare statements with statements, you, end, you see the harmony. And how does that compare with scripture? Mark 16. We see there that Christ is in heaven, and yet by his spirit he's still ministering to his church on earth. And look how Mark, the Gospel of Mark says. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God, just like DA 166, ministering in heaven. Just like 1 SM 344, pleading his blood in heaven. And they went forth, the disciples, and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. 
and confirming the word with signs following. So we see, friends, Christ, yes, he's in heaven. It's still by his spirit that he's energizing the church on earth and ministering to the church on earth. And yes, he's received up into heaven, but it's still the Lord, Christ, is working with them. Perfect harmony. We don't take one statement of its own and try to teach a new doctrine and contradict all inspiration and the Bible. Notice this statement. Christ calls our attention to the growth of the vegetable world, it's actually the apostles, as an illustration of the agency of his spirit in sustaining spiritual life. The sap of the vine ascending from the root is diffused to the branches, sustaining growth and producing blossoms and fruit. Notice what she says now. What a beautiful representation that of the sap in the vine. So the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Saviour pervades the soul and use the motives, etc. How can you understand that to be someone else? Just like the sap in the vine, so the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Saviour. Beautiful teaching. Friends, Sister White clearly is teaching that the Holy Spirit is Christ himself. This is exactly what this statement tells us. Come with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore it was altogether for their advantage, the disciples, he should lead them, go to his Father and send the Holy Spirit to be successor on earth. Now she tells you who it is. The Holy Spirit is himself, Christ himself. And divested of the personality of humanity, and therefore independent. If you want to teach the Holy Spirit to someone else from Sister White's writings, you'll never understand this statement. Because it says he's divested of the personality of humanity. It means he's stripped of that. The Holy Spirit of the Trinity never became a human being. There's nothing to divest himself of. Clearly telling you, Christ, the Holy Spirit is himself. It's unanswerable. Now remember we saw the Holy, that the third person of Godhead is written five times. It's always in reference to the coming of the Comforter. This term is never used in heaven before sin or during the Old Testament times. It's never used in reference to Christ's ministry, except when he was prophesying about it. And it's never used in reference to the new heaven and earth. It's only used in reference to this period. Only ever in reference to this period, friends. The period of the Christian church. From Pentecost, when the Comforter came. And the Comforter is with us until the Second Coming. This, every time you, from her writings, you look at this statement, it's only in that time period, only ever. And it's not after the Second Coming either. We're going to see that at the end. Only this period, never, never any other period. Now, this is where I want to make a clarification. That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit didn't exist before. As I said earlier, the Holy Spirit existed from the beginning, but not the Comforter. The Comforter has never existed until Pentecost and won't be needed after the Second Coming. The third person of Godhead is only in that period there. The third person of Godhead is the Comforter. And he came at Pentecost, he's been with the church ever since, until the church comes into the fullness of Christ and measure the stature of the fullness of Christ. And as I said, it will not be needed after the second coming. Now we're going to see why she uses the term for the comforter as the third person to guide her. This is a clue. Again, more from the Zara of Ages. Page 827. Christ gives them the breath of his own spirit, the life of his own life. Notice the reference here always to his life, to his character. Talking about the spirit. Impartation of the spirit is impartation of the life of Christ. It imbues the receiver with the very attributes of Christ. Again, page 805. Page 676. This is the same chapter of the third person of Godhead. Abiding in Christ means a constant receiving of his spirit and receive from him, by faith, the strength and perfection, this is a good one, of his own character. Notice they're all in connection with his life, attributes of Christ, life of Christ, his own life, perfection of his own character. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to impress what? His own character upon the church. Take note of this. She talks about Christ's own spirit as his own life. But talks about it as the life of Christ, the attributes of Christ, perfection of his own character. And again, he's given his spirit as a divine power to impress his own character. That's actually day 671. That's the same paragraph as the third person of Godhead. She has just told us, friends, that the third person of Godhead is the life of Christ. It's his own character. 
How do you develop character? Well, how do you live? You live a good life, you develop good character. You live a bad life, you develop a bad character. It's your thoughts and feelings combined with your actions that determine your character. If Christ is going to impart his character to you, to his church, what had he, what had he must have done first? He had to first live a life, a good life, a perfect life, a perfection of life. And then he can, you can receive from him the perfection of his own character. Then he can impart to you his own character. He had to live it first. This is why it's only in that period. That's why unless he goes away, unless he departs, he cannot give it. Unless he's glorified, it cannot come. As we saw in John 7.39. That life it's referring to there, my thing went, but that life it's referring to there, perfection of his own character, of course, it's the life he lived on earth. Now look at this statement again from the Zohar Vages, 671. Let, look at it in its context, it's so beautiful. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. That should be a small t when she wrote it. I shouldn't put the wrong emphasis there. Who would come with no modified energy, but in all the fullness of divine power? Now watch this part. It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. What does she mean there when she says, the Spirit brings or makes available what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. Christ has given His Spirit, as, as I told you, the same paragraph, she tells you who the Spirit is, as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies of evil, to impress His own character upon His church. When she says, the Spirit makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer, it means His character, His own character, His perfection of character. That's what makes effectual, that's what Christ wrought out. When did he write that out? When did he build that, make that? That's what that word means. During his life on earth. He brought out a perfect character. Now the Spirit brings that character, brings that perfect life to his church. Watch this. Side by side. Look how simple it is. DA 671 on the left. Faith I live by page 113 on the right. Look at this. Talking about the first person I got in. It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. And we saw what that means, is bringing his own character upon his church. Look at the other statement. Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character. You see how, how simple it is? And this character, this perfect life he offers to impart to us, he cannot impart that to us until he's lived it and perfected it. And then when he's glorified, that's why it says, unless I go away, the comfort cannot come. If I go away, I will send him unto you. The Holy Spirit was not yet given, for Christ was not yet glorified. That's why the third person of God, that five times she writes that it's only in reference to the comforter, only in reference to the Christian church period, never other period. This is that beautiful. The perfect humanity Christ lived and developed. The outpouring of the comforter, friends, could only take place after the life death and resurrection and glorification and ascension of Christ. Remember how we began? If I go not away, comfort will not come, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Why? Because the Holy Ghost could not be given because Christ was not yet glorified. Because it is his perfect life and character that is the attributes of Christ that he imparts to the church, which cannot be given before they lived. Look at this. For example, Acts of the Apostles, 38. During the patriarchal age, Old Testament times, the influence of the Holy Spirit had often been revealed in a marked manner. It certainly was. But what? Never in its fullness. Why? She says it was for ages. This influence had been held in restraint. What was holding it back? Something was restraining the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. For ages. I mean, you think of Moses and Elijah, you think of the wonderful miracles, and yet it's never in its fullness. Why? She tells you why. It is expedient for you that I go away, Christ said to his disciples. If I go not away, the comfort will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Why never in its fullness? This is why. This is why, friends. During his, that's Christ's humiliation upon this earth, the Spirit had not descended with all its efficacy. That's exactly what we read in the previous statement. Never in a marked matter, but never in its fullness. Why? Never descended in all its efficacy. Why? Christ declared if he went on away, he would not come. But if he went away, he would send it. This is why. It was a representation of himself. 
and after he was glorified. See, this is so powerful, this is so beautiful. It's himself, it's his very life. She's just told us, she's told us earlier, the Holy Spirit is himself. It could never be given all its power and all its fullness until Christ went away. And after he was glorified, it was manifested. Why? Because it's a representation of himself. You can't give what you don't have yet. Do you, if you want to become a carpenter, do you go to a doctor? What's he going to teach you? If you want to be a teacher, do you go to a builder? You go to someone who has perfected that trade, that knowledge, that can teach you. They can't teach you until they've perfected it. Christ could not teach his church. He could not pour out the gifts of his spirit, the attributes of his very life, until he had lived them, perfected them. And then when he was glorified, he can pour it out upon his church. That's why she only uses that statement, that third person of God, which we're going to see what she means even more in a moment, in connection to the comforter. He had to live that life first, friends, perfect his character, then he could impart it to us. The third person of the Godhead is the perfect life of Christ. The perfect life where he overcame sin, took it to the cross, took it to the tomb and came out glorified. It was a representation of himself, as it says there. And after he was glorified, it was manifest. Look at this next statement. He wrote out a perfect character and this character he offers to impart to us. Notice the order there, by the way. Notice the order. He had to first live in his humanity, build that perfect character, and then he can impart it to us. There's an order to that. This Holy Spirit of the Trinity, some mysterious being, never became a human being, what's he going to impart to us? He didn't write out anything. He didn't perfect anything. Look at the next statement, how plain it is. The A786. The majority of the statements we looked at today are all from the Zara of Ages. Amazing. Talk about taking a passage out of its context. The life he laid down in humanity, he takes up again to give to humanity. That's why, friends, before Pentecost, the Spirit would never have been given all its fullness. That's why Christ said, it's expedient for you that I go away. Because it's the very life he laid down in humanity that he could take up again and give to humanity. And he gives it through his Spirit. Holy Spirit is not some mysterious thing, friends. Look at this statement. We want the Holy Spirit, which is... How can anyone honestly teach from the Spirit of Prophecy the Holy Spirit is someone else when the Holy Spirit of Prophecy just told you the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ? I mean, there's got to be honesty in these things. And the other one. All professions of Christianity are but lifeless expressions of faith until Jesus imbues the believer with his spiritual life. Notice, notice the connection with the life all the time? Which is what? The Holy Ghost. Just on these two statements alone, you can throw it out. Just on the desire of ages alone, forget everything else. That's my favourite book. I have it marked all over the place, especially these points. I don't know how anyone could believe in the Trinity from written desire of ages. Amazing. This is why Sister White says this. He gives them the breath of his own spirit, the life of his own life. And we know that's from John 20, 22. You have God the Father before Bethlehem and you had the Son of God. After Bethlehem or the Incarnation, you now have the Son of Man. This is why Sister White calls it the comfort of the life of Christ, the third person of the Godhead. This is a life that did not exist before Bethlehem. It did not exist in heaven, it did not exist during the war, it did not exist in the Old Testament. It began at Bethlehem, friends. It began in Mary's womb. And this life lasted 33 and a little bit years. And this is where Christ built that perfect character, that perfect life, and took it to the cross and came out glorified. And now he can pour it out upon his church. Before Bethlehem, you have two divine beings. Still now you have two divine beings. But at the incarnation, one of those divine beings became a human being. The son also became a human being, friends, in fallen human nature. And he lived a perfect life. He created a new person. The person did not exist before. And that third person, friends, he lived a perfect life. Took it to the cross, as we said. Now you have the third person of God. And this is what she means by it. Notice what she says again here. Nine testimonies. They have one God and one Saviour and one Spirit. The Spirit of Christ. 
final thought, the one we saw earlier, this time period of the comforter, the first person who got it, wasn't available till Pentecost, till Christ was glorified and ascended to heaven. And as I, saw, I said earlier, this third person of Godhead will not be needed, friends, in heaven after the second coming because it's to do with sin. Remember how the statement began? Sin could be overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of Godhead. You won't need to overcome sin in heaven. Sinners will be blotted out by then and the saints in heaven won't be sinning anymore. We're told when the life of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, he shall come to claim them at his own. And we saw with the first person of God, it is the life of Christ. When it's perfectly lived out, he's going to return to take them home. And that's why this statement is never used outside of this time period here. Now, everything we've seen, we're going to see in the following biblical passage. Beautiful passage. Ephesians chapter 4. Just notice with me for a moment verse 9. Now he that ascended, what is it but he that also descended first into the lowest parts of the earth? This verse here in its context, unless you understand this truth we just looked at this morning, today, you'll never understand this verse. Never. You'll never understand what Paul is trying to tell you here, what the Spirit is trying to tell you. When you understand what we have just learned, you watch how powerful, how beautiful this passage is now. Remember we saw, it's his very life, a life that he had to live and perfect. He had to develop certain attributes and then he could pour them out upon his church. Watch this passage now. Verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. That's his Christ after his ascension. What are those gifts he gave to men? Verse 11. The gifts of the Spirit. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Remember we saw that the third person of Godhead is the very life of Christ that he pours upon his church, the life that he lived and perfected. Here we see that the gifts of the Spirit that he gave to men after he ascended to heaven, the gifts of being an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, etc. And many others. Friends, who was the greatest prophet that ever lived? The greatest evangelist that ever lived? You know, Christ would take a seed or he, he would point to a lily or well, that beautiful parable about the sower, the wisdom of God in those parables. When he would teach, everybody learned from him. That's what I love about his teachings. Whether you were educated, highly knowledgeable, whether you were a child, a poor or a peasant, everybody learned, everyone took from him when he taught because he was such a great evangelist. He could teach in such a beautiful, simple way. He was the greatest evangelist that ever lived. He was the greatest pastor of the flock that ever lived, the greatest teacher of the flock. All these things of Christ's life, friends. They all belong to him. He perfected his life. He could pour out his gifts upon his church. So he ascends to heaven. He pours out his very life, which is the gifts of the Spirit. As I was saying earlier, and before you can teach someone as a carpenter, you have to become a master of that trade. You're going to teach someone to be an evangelist. You're going to attribute them. You have to be a great evangelist, etc. This is the very life of Christ, friends. Before he could pour out these gifts, what did we learn? Unless I depart, he will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him. The Holy Spirit was not yet given because Christ was not yet glorified. What did he have to do first? He had to first live that life in human flesh and take it to the cross. Look at verse 9. Now you understand what Paul means by verse 9. Who is he that ascended to heaven and gave gifts unto men, evangelists, prophets, pastors, apostles, teachers? Who is he? But he that first descended into the lowest part of the earth. How powerful the scriptures are when you have the truth. How it leads to greater truth. This verse has blessed me so much when I learned this. I just, I just, you get so overjoyed when God shows you something like that. He had to first descend into the lowest parts of the earth. That means his condescension as a human being. And it also it takes in especially the cross and his life of humility. Where he developed those wonderful gifts as an evangelist and pastor and teacher, etc. He had the first descent, friends, like we saw in our, in our study. He lived that perfect life. Why was it given? Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. Remember? He impressed upon them the perfection of his own character. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Until how long? For how long was it needed? Remember that time period? 
till we all come to the unity of the faith and what else? And of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature. The church is going to grow unto the fullness of Christ, friends. When the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, then he shall come to claim them as his own. Beautiful. When a simple statement, the statement of Sister White, that so many take out of its connection and destroy such a beautiful teaching, it's the very life of Christ that never existed before but now is available to his church. Look at Hebrews 5, verse 8 and 9 while we're here. Same thing, same principle. We're finished now. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Verse 7 talks about his days of his flesh. It's Jesus. Particularly experience of Gethsemane. Strong crying and tears. In verse 8. Though he was a son, or even though he was a son of God, that's what it means. He had no special privileges, friends. Though he was a son, yet learnt. Look at that word learnt, how important that word is. Christ had to learn obedience. Learnt the obedience how? By the things which he suffered. Chris spoke about that last week. You know, obedience brings suffering. And after he learned obedience, after he lived that perfect righteous life, what happens? Verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them who obey him. See again the order? The life he laid down in humanity. That perfect life in which he learned obedience through suffering. Same life he gives to us. That's when he became the, the author of eternal salvation unto all them who obey him. Our final slide. This is more than just a doctrine, friends. This is powerful. Not only do you understand Christ better, not only do you understand who the comforter is, and you can draw strength from that because he has walked over the same ground as us. He's had to, as we just saw there, suffer being tempted. He had to learn obedience through suffering. And he can impart to us the strength we need in overcoming. But look at this statement here. This is 1893. Why is this important? This is a general conference after 1888. We know what happened in 1888, which, by the way, Wagner and Jones haven't got time in this presentation, but if you research, you'll see they taught that Christ was truly the only begotten Son of God. Wagner and Christ and his righteousness alone five times says Christ had a beginning in that little booklet, which is the very heart of the message of 1888. After the disappointment of 1888, the rejection of the message, and all the troubles that brought and the divisions, etc. With some time, with some councils and some time, some men started to turn around, started to concede, men like Uriah Smith and others who were the ringleaders. And there was repentance, there was some there was recovery, there was a lot of recovery from Reverend realised how serious it was. Anyway, at this session here, 1893, as I was saying, there's a lot of recovery, and they wanted to come together again, and they wanted to study what it was about 1888, the very heart, the very heart of the message that Sister White called the loud cry, and that the latter rain had already begun. And look what H. Christian, who was at that conference, wrote. If you want to understand the heart of 1888, friends, here it is. The whole conference was convened to study that. Look what he says. It was really at the general conference session in 1893, that light on justification or righteousness by faith, they would use that term interchangeably, seemed to gain its greatest victory. It was fought. Notice now, this is what the light of the message of 1888 was that they, they, they understood in 1893. It was fought that it was the righteous life of Christ here on earth that imputed to us by faith which brought such a great blessing. Why is this the heart of the message of 1888? Because not only did they teach correctly about sin and the human nature of Christ, that he partook of our nature, a fallen nature, and he perfected his life in that nature. And through his spirit now he can impart that righteous life that he lived here on earth to us by faith that brought such a great blessing. You're reading there for yourself, friends, the very heart of the message of 1888 that was to finish the work. If you understand that third person of the Godhead, or if you teach that third person of Godhead to be another being, not only he cannot be your comforter, not only did he not live a life of a human being or a righteous life, nor can you look to that whoever that being is by faith to receive that life. 
And so you can see how truth or error, how much it will impact upon the life we live. When we understand the truth about Christ, His nature, the life He lived on earth, and the truth about His Spirit, you can understand the very heart of the message of 1888, and you can be, of course, profited by it. That's why Ephesians 4.13 says, we come into the knowledge, the unity of the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your mercy. We want to thank you that no matter how things are misconstrued and, and how many false teachers there are today trying to destroy the beautiful message you gave us through the writings of Sister White. Nonetheless, Father, thou hast promised to honour those that honour you and, and he who is willing to do thy will will know of the doctrine and you keep your promises. And we thank thee that you have revealed to us the truth about who the third person of God it is, the truth about Christ and his beautiful life that he had to live and perfect before he could pour it out upon his church. That he had to first descend into the lowest parts of the earth before he could ascend to heaven and, and give gifts unto men. Help us, Lord, to not only believe this truth, but to appropriate it into our lives, to look to Christ in faith, knowing that the life he lived can be ours, and it will be. It will be perfectly reproduced in his people. And that will put an end to sin and suffering. May we be part of that company, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.